Come on, y'all come ready today? Hey, this is the day that the Lord has made. So I will choose to rejoice and be glad in it. We've got a lot of good reasons to rejoice today, do we not? We serve a good, good God. We are part of a, a good family of believers. We are in a safe place where you're not going to get judged or criticized or have religious spirits coming against you that we each can come as we are and be who God has made us to be. But that is not the same case of what we face in the world. The Bible says that the world system is governed by the God of this world, and his name is Satan. That though that God has established and, and created the church to be the safe haven, to be the gathering together of like-minded people who lift up the name of Jesus, when we step out of this gathering, when we step out of, of the time we have together, we walk right back into a cruel and wicked place. Not the people of the world, but the system of the world is what God is referring to when he says that this world's system is governed by the God of this world. But he also declares that we serve only one true master, that we will love one and hate the other. And when we are encountering people who, even though they, they may have the, the right intentions, they are using bad judgment and they are used in moments of weakness against us and hurt us and cause pain in our life, we are faced with decisions in those moments of what will we do with what has taken place against us. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. My prayer last night walking into Saturday night service was this, God, you gave us a promise through your son Jesus that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Then God, let the church in this moment, in this word, let the church prevail against the gates of hell. I'm believing, God, that we will walk and crash in to the gates of hell and take back what the enemy has stolen from us. That joy, that peace, that love that God has given his greatest sacrifice in his son Jesus, so that we may be redeemed and be free. But the truth is, most of us, all of us, have experienced hurts and pains. We've all been afflicted at some point in our life. We've all been attacked at some point in our life. And we've all been hurt. We've all experienced pain. At times, we've experienced pain that is indescribable. It's uncomprehendable. We've, we've all had those moments where we just shout, Why, God? How can you let this happen to me? And the truth is, our loving Father, He has given us dominion. He has given us authority over this world. But we have relinquished it since the time of Adam and Eve with sin. And so therefore we have now relinquished that authority to the God of this world. And Satan is ruthless and he is relentless. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy every good thing in your life, even your life itself. And at times when he uses people to bring that havoc, when he uses people to, to inflict that pain, we come to a place in life where we are so hurt where we are so wounded that we don't know how to get out of that place and embrace our future. We've talked about in this series the blessed life, how to live a blessed life in our faith, how to live a blessed life in our family. Last week I talked about the blessed life in general using the story of Abraham. He is the first one recorded in the Word of God to be blessed by God. And the reason why he was blessed by God is because he was obedient to the call of God on his life. God called him to leave everything that was comfortable to him, everyone that loved him, everybody that he knew. God called him to leave it all behind and go to the land of Canaan. That land that he went to is still the land to this day that the Israelites live in. He gave Abraham a promise that if you will do this, I will bless you like crazy. I'll make everything you touch be blessed. 
Everybody you blessed, I'll bless. Everyone that stands against you, I'll curse. I will bless you and make you famous in all of the land. And he even said, I will bless every family that will ever touch the face of this earth through you. How is that possible that God would bless all humanity through one man? Because he knew that he would be the lineage that would bring Jesus forth into the earth thousands of years later. God already set up. A plan when Adam and Eve failed that he would now have to send his one and only son to walk into this earth, to be born into this earth so that we all could identify with him, not just as a God on a throne, but a man who gave up everything for us. But how then? How do we embrace our future like Abraham did? How do we walk into our purpose and our destiny, especially when we are still allowing the hurts and the wounds that we have experienced. So that's the question today. What hurt, what pain are you allowing to hold you back from your future? I don't want to make light of it in any way, shape, or form. We have all experienced it, each and every one of us, whether it would be something that's taken place in a church, and maybe that's what drove you out of church for years, is you were in a church where the leadership was insecure, and therefore the insecurity gets gets bled and bred throughout the entire fabric of the church, and, and they overpromised and undercommitted and, and underproduced in your life, or maybe it was a life group or a small group that chewed you up and spit you out, or, or a dear friend that calls themselves a Christian that, that just violated your trust and your love. Or, or maybe maybe it was the divorce that you went through. Maybe you're not able to move past that pain of that divorce. Maybe it's a loved one that you lost. Even a child. We had somebody in second service. He walked up and said with his mother. His mother was there for the first time in 30 years. His mother came to church with him. And on the day that I'm preaching this, the reason why she hasn't been in church, she lost his sister, her daughter, years and years ago. And she's been so wounded and hurt that she's been incarcerated in that place of pain. And today, she was set free. What are we allowing? I don't want to make light of it. In any way, shape, or form, I never make light of any pain, any problem that anyone has ever faced. I've faced a share of my own, but I still don't know exactly what you've been through. Only you know what you have been through, and only you and God are the ones that are going to be able to walk out of that place of pain. Let's look at Genesis Chapter 11, we're going back into the story of Abraham, but now we're going to see it as it began before his name was even changed to Abraham when he was just called Abram. Verse 27 of chapter 11 of Genesis, this is the account of Terah's family. Terah was the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. Remember Lot? We talked about him last week. That's Abraham's nephew that he took with him and blessed because he was blessed. But Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans. Hear this now. Abram's brother, Terah's other son, died in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. It was the land of his birth while his father Terah was still living. Meanwhile, Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, later to be changed to Sarah. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. Milcah and her sister Iscah were daughters of Nahor's brother Haran. But Sarai was unable to become pregnant and had no children. And one day Terah took his son Abram and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and his grandson Lot, which was the son of Haran, the brother of Abram. And they moved away from the Ur of Chaldeans. He was headed, Terah. He was headed for the land of Canaan. Hear this clearly today, family. This is the pinnacle of everything that we will talk about today. There was a man named Terah who was the father of Abram who would later be called Abraham. This man was the original one of the family that God called to go to Canaan. 
Abraham was not the first to receive that call of God on his life. It was first his father, Terah. Let's pick it back up. He was headed for the land of Canaan, but they stopped at Haran and settled there. Terah lived for 205 years, and he died while he was still in Haran. This is so clear to me of what took place. If you'll remember, not just this town, Haran, but it was also the same name of the son that he lost back in Ur of the Chaldeans. So here's Terah's story. Terah loses one of his sons to death. Now his other son is married, but his wife can't have grandchildren. He has nobody but Lot left that reminds him of his son that has passed away. So he sets out on the call of God on his life to go to the promised land of Canaan, but he ends up crossing through, passing through a town that happens to be named after the name of his dead son. And it brings up every memory of the pain that he had already suffered. Now he can feel that nostalgic feeling. I'm in a town named after my own son. Maybe he didn't even know that that town even existed. And when he got there, he felt the honor that the people had towards him and his family. And and all that he could think about was the loss of his son. He was stuck in the place of his pain. It reminded him of the greatest pain that he could ever experience and he was unable to move out of that place of pain. Look what it says. He was headed for the land of Canaan but they stopped at Aaron and settled. The word, the the meaning of of the word, of the name Terah, the meaning of his name means to settle or to compromise or to delay. Terah delayed his call to move forward into his future because he was reminded of the greatest pain that he had ever faced. Terah settled. He compromised the call of God. We talked about it last week. Favor, blessing follows obedience. The blessing was going to come upon Terah, but Terah refused to follow through. He could not, he would not move out of that place of pain and embrace his future. But look what happens now. This verse 32 of chapter 11, the Bible wasn't written in chapters or verses. We did that years and years later to make it easy to find things and memorize things. Picture it like one big story because in verse 1, the story continues. Then the Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing others. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. The meaning of the name of Abram is father to many. Hear this and hear this clearly. Terah was unable to move past the place of his pain to embrace his future, so God shifted that call upon Abram, his son. And Abram said yes to the call and became the blessed, most blessed man on the planet. So how? How do we secure our future? How do we move out of the place of pain? Whether it would be Something that happened to you physically or emotionally or spiritually or willfully or even, even mindfully. Maybe you've been, you've been just messed up by folks that have been messed up. How do you move past it? How do you come out of that place, that prison of pain, and walk in to the future of the purpose that God has destined you to walk? I'd rather be in the position of Abram than in the position of Terah. But all of us can recognize 
How can you blame Terah? He lost his son, and he came upon a place that gave him every memory of that loss, overwhelming him again and again. So I want to give you three points, and I do not in any way, shape, or form want to make this feel gimmicky or, or here's the formula. But this is the tried, tested, and proven word of the living God. That if we will be obedient to this word that we will see. I've broken it down in three points of a process. There is a process to freedom. There is a process to leave that place of pain. And if we will allow God to walk us through that process, then we will be stronger and better. Because here's the truth. Anything that has taken place in your life that has caused you hurt or pain, it's caused a fracture in your soul. In your mind, your will, your emotion, in your spirit, in your body, whatever that's been, just like if you break a bone, it takes absolute care and direction and time to heal. There is a process for us to be healed internally as well. And the first step of that process is to forgive those who have hurt you in the past. And I know this is a lot easier said than done. Truth is, it's a lot easier to read it on paper or on a screen than it is to walk it out. How, how do I forgive somebody that, that molested you? Or how do you forgive somebody that, that abandoned you? How do you forgive somebody that you were supposed to trust, that was supposed to, to keep you safe, to to help you become the person that you are or should be. And how, 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 do I, how do I forgive such a person? Because the truth is, folks, unforgiveness doesn't hurt them. Unforgiveness only hurts you. When we refuse to forgive those that have hurt us, we're not hurting them. We're hurting ourselves. Look at Jesus' words in Mark chapter 11, verse 25. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone. Not just who you want to, not just who it's easiest to, but forgive anyone that you are holding a grudge against. So that your Father in heaven will forgive you of your sins too. Jesus goes on to teach it like this, that we cannot be forgiven unless we are first willing to forgive. So when we refuse to forgive those who honestly, in the natural mind, don't deserve forgiveness, then we allow ourselves to be incarcerated in that place of pain. We hold back our own future. We settle. We compromise with our purpose, with our plans that God has laid out for us. And it's a process to forgive. You would ask, how? How can I forgive somebody who has so deeply hurt me? And the only advice I can give is the godly advice that is written within his word, is you ask God for the strength to do it. He's not just here to talk to. When it's saying that when you are praying first, forgive anybody, Jesus said it in what we call the Lord's Prayer. Forgive those who have harmed you as you have been forgiven of the harms that you have done, of the sins that you have done. Forgive those who have sinned against you. What he's telling us is this. It's a part of our prayer life. We should be asking God. I, I've had things happen that I didn't want to forgive anybody over. I wanted to get even. But when I was forgiven of everything that I've ever done, and when I read that I must forgive, my first question back to God is, will you help me? Because I can't do it on my own. I can't forgive them without you. And God began to do a work in my life to help me walk through that process of forgiving those who have hurt me. Because the truth is this, if the, the person or the, the ones that have hurt you, chances are they're still going to go on and do it to others. So you, by you not unforgiving them, by you not forgiving them, doesn't all of a sudden make them better or make them wake up or make them change. 
It only hurts you. And God, through the comfort of his Holy Spirit, through the freedom of his Son, he is here. He is there every moment for you to help walk you through that process. This is the heart of God. Number two is to allow God to heal old wounds. Because once I have forgiven, that is the beginning process of my healing. Once I have forgiven, but then I need God's help to mend that. Like a broken bone needs help to be mended, so does a broken soul or a broken spirit. When we give God his opportunity, look at Psalm 147. He, God the Father, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. This is his heart. This is his desire. And truth is, we need God to do this. And even though most of our hurts, probably almost every one of them came through our mistakes or others against us. You know what it often takes? It often takes others to help you walk through that. That is what the church is here for. We are called by God to serve one another. The leadership of the church is called not to ever be served, but to lay their life down and serve the body of Christ. And that's what we want to do. We have small groups set up that are inner healing small groups with, with folks that have dedicated their life and been trained and, and, and have been, been through it themselves where they are here to love you, to meet with you, to walk with you. Because there's times for me, I'll tell you, I didn't get the inner healing ministry in the beginning because when I got saved, Jesus, it was a, it was a, it was a moment, an epic moment that not everybody necessarily has the same experience that I had where I was saved, delivered, and healed all in one moment. And the truth is, the majority of, of humanity doesn't experience that. And whether it be through your personal prayer time, whether it be through your personal journey that you seek God in this, or that you're asking someone like the church for help in this, the bottom line is the most critical thing is that you take the time to allow God the process of healing those old wounds. And I'm telling you, it's easier said than done. I know that it is. Even after, even after getting saved, even after leaving the Marine Corps and giving my life to ministry and laying it all out, I've experienced more hurt within the church than I had before the church. Not that they did worse things to me, but it just came from somewhere I never expected it to come from. Some of you know this story. I planted a church in Youngstown, Ohio, my hometown. I knew it wasn't my final destination. I knew it wasn't my Canaan, but I knew that God had called me to do it, to leave a lasting legacy in a place that was dark and desperate and in need of a life-giving church. I planted it. My wife and I believed and, and, and prepared and already was raising up a couple to, to take it in the future. We thought a couple years, three, five years down the road. And the organization that we planted it with, it, the church was super, super amazing. It was growing really fast, and, and, and people were coming to it like crazy and getting saved like crazy, and, and God was on the move. And the insecurities and in the leadership of this organization that we planted with they became apparent. Their insecurities caused them to begin to try to control and manipulate my staff and, and those around me. And they started doing all kinds of weird stuff that I, I knew happened in business world, but I had no idea what happened in church world. And it all came down to a big blow up where I just said, look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I, don't, I don't play. I'm going to hurt people if you keep doing this. Knock it off. And they gave me a choice. Walk away, or we're gonna take, we're gonna destroy it. We're gonna just, we're gonna shut the entire thing down. And so I chose to walk away. You know how hurt I was? I could tell you, I, I, I've never been depressed per se in my life. I felt a clinical depression come upon me, this darkness come upon me for six months. 
I didn't even want to live. I wanted to hurt people. I wanted to do, I wanted to, people get in the flesh that are religious, that they want to do stupid things like that. I'm a Marine. I get in the flesh, it, I, I, want to, I want to do things in the flesh. You follow what I'm saying? I want to bust some kneecaps, crack some heads. But could you imagine if I would not have allowed God, if I would not have forgiven and allowed God to heal me and, and allow God to take that process that was necessary, I would have never obeyed the call to come to Texas. Right? Never. But then I did. I obeyed that call. Three years later, we're here. We're ready to plant, reach church. God gave me a specific plan. Laid it out for me. Made it simple. Here's the dates. Gave me the specific dates of when to do the, 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 the launch and when to do the soft launch. And like often I do, I'm the most impatient human being on the planet. And it's one of the fruit of the spirits that I'm continuously working on. Okay? We moved down here. We were down here six weeks. I hit my 37th birthday. In that time, I turned 37 and I realized I'm not getting any younger. I'm bored out of my mind. We should move the soft launch up. So I called the team and told them 12 days from now we're going to launch a church. They thought I was crazy. I was crazy. Truth is. So we do it. We launch a church. God had given me a word. I had 16 adults move their lives from Pennsylvania, Ohio, and from Missouri down here to Austin because they believed in the call of God that was on my life to win a city for Jesus. They're trusting me. They're supporting me. They, they're, they're my team. They're my family. They've got my back. And God had spoken a word to me that if I do it the way he said to do it, that we are going to see over 200 people on day one and over 25 people saved. I was so excited. We're going to be a self-established family. I've never been to this state in my life. I don't know a single person. And we're going to do this. This is awesome. Let's do it. So we moved that soft lunch up to 10-10-10. They came to me that morning. They said, Pastor, how many chairs should we put out? And I said, where's your faith at? God said he's going to have 200 here. Put all 200 out. Three people came. Tres. Trois. Three. Are you hearing me? Three people came. And never once did another person walk through the doors in two months. And I'm like... What have I done? I've moved my life to a state I've never been. I didn't know anybody here. I thought God called me. I'm racing around there. I'm like, God, I finally do the God, why? And then he answered, well, you did what you wanted to do, not what I told you to do. You should have did what I told you to do. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do now? Well, go do what I told you to do. Is that easy? Yeah, yeah, go do it. So I met with the leadership team. I told them. I blew this. I got ahead of God. This is me being impatient. God's teaching me a lesson. And I preached a good message to him about it. On Thanksgiving, we all had a meal together. That's how big the church was. We all sat at one table. Are you with me? And I said, we're going to still keep our prayer groups throughout the week. But we're not going to have any more meetings until the date that God gave us. But from that day to Thanksgiving till January, nobody knows this. I was so depressed, discouraged, because all the nostalgic feelings of what happened in Youngstown with that church came back upon me. What if? What if I'm not the man of God I thought I was? What if I'm not the man of God they believe I am? Well, what if God never called me here to Texas? What if it was the cold pizza I had the night before? Are you hearing me? What if? What have I done? I moved my life here. I, I've put everything on the line. I sold everything I had. I gave every penny of it in this year. What am I thinking? What am I doing? And all of those thoughts, all of those thoughts were pounding in my brain for six weeks straight. And the only thing that I don't know how to do is quit. So I kept walking forward like a mindless dummy into January, all along hoping, hoping, God, just, just, just give me a reason to not do this, but I knew God had called me to do it. Hear this now. We planted this church four years and nine months ago. We have seen over 6,000 people give their life to Jesus. 
6,000. And we're just getting started. This is just the beginning. Can you imagine if I allowed myself to stay in my place of pain? That memory, that nostalgic feeling. Number three, here's how we walk through this, is you put your trust in God. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Hear me, you don't have to trust the people you have forgiven already. If they have hurt you, if they have wounded you, you don't have to give them access to your life again. You don't have to trust them with your, with your feelings again or with your, with your physical presence again. You don't have to do any of that. You just got to forgive them. You just got to let go of the anger, of the grudge, of the hurt, of the offense that you have against them. That's what you got to do. That's it. That's all you got to do. But you have to trust God. Do not depend on your own understanding. You know what I've found in life? You can't reason with the devil. You can't reason with evil. When wickedness and mean and hurtful things happen to you and you ask why the truth is, you typically can't. You can't find the right reason because it doesn't make any sense. He's ruthless. He's relentless. Seek God's will. Seek his will in all that you do. And he, God the Father, he will show you. Hear this now. He will show you which path to take. He showed Terah. Terah came to a place of pain that he remembered of his son's death. And he was paralyzed in that pain and refused to go further. So God took the call and put it on Abraham. He showed Abraham which path path to take if I would have refused to continue if I would have refused to leave Youngstown and follow the call of God on my life if I would refuse to to do it the way God said it to do it and restart the church in January then you know what God would have still reached those 6,000 souls he just would have went and found an Abraham to do it are you hearing me he would have found somebody that was willing to be obedient and they would have walked in to an amazing future. And that's the challenge for all of us. Is moving out of that place of pain. That insecurity. And insecurity is somewhere in our life where we lack security. We lack confidence. And all insecurities are caused by hurt and pain of some sort. And we want to walk through that because here's the truth, folks. Insecurities are stemmed out of hurt, and hurt people hurt people. So when we don't walk through that healing process, when we don't allow God to take us through that healing process, then all we end up doing is becoming a part of the vicious cycle of hurt. Then we hurt our children, we hurt our friends, we hurt our family, we hurt our church. We hurt people because we haven't been healed of that hurt. Are you hearing me this day? God wants to heal you. Can we bow our heads, close our eyes just for a moment? God wants to heal you. But that healing process begins with forgiveness. Not just forgiveness of the sins that you have committed, but forgiving those for the sins that they have committed against you. If you came here today and you don't know that you know that you know that Jesus is yours and that you are his, if you have never experienced the life-giving power of God Almighty filling your heart with love and grace, if you've never experienced the feeling of knowing that every mistake that you have ever made is wiped out like it never happened, then today, today let's, let's make that choice. Let's make that decision. Maybe you've prayed such a prayer at some point in your life. But you've allowed the circumstances surrounding you or maybe it's others that have hurt you, that have caused you to drift, to backslide, to walk away from the commitment that you once made. Then right here, right now, let's recommit that yes. If that's you and you want to say yes to Jesus, then on the count of three, 
I'm going to ask you to put that hand up nice and high in the air, and then we're going to pray a prayer right there in your seat. With that, if that's you, without delay, on three. One, two, three. Come on, put that hand up for me. Come on, nice and high. Thank you. Hands are up all over from left to right, front to back. Hands are up all over. If you just raise that hand, place it right on your heart. And if you're here today and you need, you know that you need, maybe you didn't raise it hand, maybe you know that you're secure in your eternity, but you know that you need healing in your heart. You need forgiveness within your life towards others. Then just place your hand right on your heart. And let's all of us pray this prayer where our own two ears can hear it. Just say, Jesus, I come to you today. Come on, pray where you can hear it. Say, I come to you today. And I ask you, forgive me of every mistake, every sin I have ever made. Help me to forgive those that have sinned against me. Give me a fresh start, a new beginning. Heal my heart. Take my life. Use it to help others and not hurt others. From this day forward, I surrender all. Use me to help in Jesus' name. Amen.